Recorded live. Hello and welcome to the Castle of Horror interview segment where we talk to writers and creators of today's genre worlds from Denver, Colorado. I'm your host, Jason Henderson, creator of the Alex Van Helsing novels from HarperCollins. This week we're talking to Glenn Hirschberg about his new book, Good Girls, a grim, grisly, standalone sequel to the book Motherless Child from Tor. Glenn Hirschberg has won the Shirley Jackson Award and three International Horror Guild Awards. Say hello, Mr. Glenn. Hi. Hi, Jason. Thanks for having me on. Oh, I'm so excited to talk to you about this. Um, okay, I got a little bit more of your bio here. More than a decade ago, you co-founded, this is interesting, I want to ask you about this, the Rolling Darkness Review, the Rolling Darkness Review, a multimedia experience which incorporates theatrical lighting and live music to illuminate and enhance the Halloween tradition of ghost story readings, um, and you continue to perform in the review, which apparently is every October in L.A., Glenn Hirschberg uh, and his family live in L.A. where he teaches high school. Is that true? Yeah, I've taught, I've taught every grade between seventh grade and graduate school. Um, right now I run a creative writing program that I've spent a long time developing at a high school in L.A. Wow, that is really, really cool. So, 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 so in, in theory, you're stu- if, I were, if I were a student and I knew that my teacher – were like publishing and like doing interviews out there. I mean, I would be totally like cyber stalking you. Basically. You think so, but it's high school. They don't really care. <laughs> <laughs> They're impressed for about eight seconds, <laughs> and then really they have that, they have better you know better people to cyber stalk. <laughs> it, it 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 may well be. I I knew somebody once who that came back from the Peace Corps, and she's and I said, wow, people must be fascinated by that. And she goes. I give it about five minutes. Generally, people <laughs> are fascinated <laughs> very briefly. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, but yeah, well, I, I'm sure that there are at least a few who will be fascinated by all of this. So there are if a few of them are listening, welcome, and we'll try and bear, the, bear in mind that, that minors are present. Um, <laughs> all right. The new book is Good Girls, and it is, a, it is in the world of your book, Motherless Child, and um, – what I wanted to ask about is, ostensibly, many, many characters in this are vampires. So at the broadest sweep, this is a vampire novel. So what I want to know is, uh, you know, how, how did you wind up writing vampire fiction, and how does somebody how – do how do you come to vampire fiction in this day and age when it, when it seems like everybody already has an opinion about it? Kicking and screaming is the, is the answer in my <laughs> case, honestly, because – I um when uh it actually started when um Ellen Datlow, who's an editor in the field, um asked me uh wrote and asked if I had a vampire story for an anthology she was putting together and I considered myself a serious literary ghost story writer. Um yeah. you know, I, I in some ways I guess I still do. But I was young and snotty, and I wrote back to Ellen Datlow, an eminence in our field, and right. said, I don't write vampire stories. And within a day, much to my astonishment, I had these two women in my head who in some ways have dominated a lot of my writing time ever since. Right. And they started chattering to one another, and I started getting really interested in them, and Within a week, I had myself a vampire story. So I wrote Ellen back and said, ah, it turns out I do write vampire stories. And this is where I get my comeuppance because she returned my email and said, well, that's great and good luck with it. The anthology is not happening right now, but I hope you sell it somewhere. Right. Um, <laughs> and so I, eventually I used it for the Rolling Darkness review. And um, that was a story called Like Lick'em Sticks Like Tina Fey. And I figured, okay, well, good. That was my one experiment with that, and I'm done with it. And about a year later, I, the only time in my career this has happened, I woke up and had, I knew what happened five minutes after the end of that story and what had happened five minutes before it. And easiest book I've ever written in my life or will ever write, Motherless Child, was wrapped up 10 or 11 months later. Um, and then eventually uh, that came out relatively small press with the good people at Earthling. And um, when Tor picked 
picked up Motherless Child for a mass market edition, uh, they said, by the way, uh, we'd like to buy a trilogy. And I really did respond, I don't write vampire trilogies. Um, <laughs> and this time it took all of 24 hours before I realized that I wasn't done with especially the, the women at the heart of this trilogy, which is always what, what drives me, the, the characters at the heart of it. You're, you seem nearly done with them at the beginning of this thing because at least one of those characters has been blown to pieces. It, yes. And, and still, <laughs> and still becomes... But I said the women at the heart. It, it was no longer just those two, but you're right. And I also, I do try to honor, as this became a series, the Motherless Child really was, a, it felt like a gift from the muses, you know, a reward for doing the slaving away for years on end that we all do if you're going to be a writer and bashing yeah. your head against the wall. And it just came so easily, including an ending, which I will probably never come up with a better ending to anything. And I got it literally on the last day. It's one of the very few times I've written something and immediately said, hey, that's pretty good. Um, oh, that's nice. That's but nice. I, because that ending is a strong ending, part of what makes it strong is um, without – too many spoilers, a fairly final thing happens for at least one of the characters. And all I'll say about Good Girls is that I definitely wanted to honor that. I didn't want to cheat. So I don't. If you uh, could explain, because this is, a, this is a sweeping book. I mean, it, you know, there are a lot of different settings yep. and, and characters. If you could explain, like, in an elevator pitch, what, uh, you know, what is Good Girls about? Like, your, your publisher right now is, is saying... Hey, even if you haven't read Motherless Child, you can pick up here. Yeah, back. which so, I have mixed feelings so, oh. about, honestly. I mean, I, I, uh, no, I mean, they are doing exactly what they should be doing and trying to sell my books, and I hope yes. that works. My honest feeling is that they asked me, and I really tried to comply, to make sure that Good Girls could be read without having right. read Motherless Child, and, and I think it can be. Do I think it's better? I assume what that means is, uh, if you, anytime you bring up a character, you try to reintroduce them. That is basically that. right. That is really that. That's what I tried to do while I was writing it. But it is absolutely meant in some ways, though it does introduce several new threads and new characters. It was meant to be a continuation of that story. Um, but I would say that the whole thing, this whole trilogy, what it turns out to be about, is every character's hunger uh, for connection and for a reason to go on living. And the, the vampires, in some ways, when I was writing Motherless Child, I knew I wanted the vampires to be really scary. This wasn't a, you know anti-Twilight reaction or whatever. That it just, I, I'm, I'm with M.R. James on this, that you know, the monsters are not your friends. Right. Um, and I wanted them. I wanted them to be a, a disturbing element, but I wasn't that. I was much more interested in the effect of vampirism or the, or whatever on my main characters. As this has developed, I've started to get to know my monsters too, and they are not just human beings. You know, with a with a hunger. I, I really tried to ask. So if this was really, if you really couldn't die. And you really could do whatever you wanted, except mm, periodically you got to prey on somebody. Right. What would that do to you over a long, long, long period of time? What kind of creature could you possibly become? Is there such a thing as a meaningful existence in that state? And so I think all three books start to be about that for people and for the monsters alike without – humanizing the monsters over much because I want them to stay different from us and frightening and not something you would ever want to be or certainly run across. But even in the, in the villain role, you think of, I, I, I keep thinking about how many different kinds of vampires, like if you take a movie like um, Daughters of Darkness, I don't know yep. if you've seen this. You may have. Oh, great. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So that posits that vampires would be uh, hedonist but sad. Yes, you right, know, and and that, that, and then other other vampires have been posited as being um, sadists, 
you know, and, yep. you know, where where you end up basically being interested in in Your heightening exploring. sensation or something. Right. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Constantly trying to push the boundaries of sensation, and others. Vampires would become a bunch of like Thomas Mertens, just sort of wandering out into the desert. And, and I, I think mine are the danger or the thing that seems to happen to them is that they become unmoored from anything we would think of as emotions. Um, not that they're emotionless, but that they don't recognize that, that, that emotion just becomes a boring tedious thing and so literally they're filling time without any particular you know they, they do wind up having interest as a matter of fact the, the the monster at the heart of the first two books although there's a worse one who gets introduced in this book uh, is this creature called the whistler who really triggers it all and he fills his time by making himself a stellar musician who gets his kicks out of flattening audiences by performing music full of emotion that he doesn't feel at all. Right. Um, right. Interesting. That's that's such a sort of, you know, if, if we think of all of these characters as metaphors for things that humans can do, yeah. that's very much what a, what a sort of a, a person who's become dissociated from from everybody around him. Might, I, I think might that's right. To, it's also in you know, a really scary way. <laughs> And I'm talking about scary to me now. Yeah. It's also kind of what a lot of artists do, that in a certain kind of way, um, you know, a lot of people, a lot of my students, interestingly, when I talk to my students who, you know, it's, I used to think you couldn't spot talent in high school. I certainly don't think anyone would have pointed at me and other than my obvious desire to do it and said, yeah, that guy. Um, but I, I can see it in the students. And what a lot of them seem to have in common, like one of them, uh, it broke my heart, came in one day really upset, sort of sat down next to me and said, last night my mother said I was a tree. Um, tree? A tree, T-R-E-E, -E, tree. Meaning yeah. that, that things, life sort of bumps up against her but doesn't really move her or shake her. Huh. And I thought, that's a lot of the artist thing for a lot of people because there's always a piece of you that's yeah. a half step back watching you feel, th watching yourself feel things. And so it's not, you know, I don't I, think it's I, that I, artists I, don't yeah. feel things, but there is a, a detachment that is part of the process. Yeah. You know, I so I got very interested defense. in that. You know, I mean, think about it. You, you, if you, one way to avoid feeling the pain of something happening to you is to automatically start cataloging what's going on. You know, That's exactly start, right. You know, both as a defensive thing, like, oh, what am I feeling? Oh, I'm afraid. Oh, how yep. interesting that is. You know, and you know, if you if you do this enough, you can live your entire life with irony. So you're like, oh, how interesting. I'm yes. actually jogging. How That's how exactly American right. of me. And, <laughs> and as a matter of fact, there, there's a there's a you meet more of the vampires. You get to know a little bit more of their culture, such as it is. Uh, yeah. There aren't a lot what of is, them. What is that culture? But, uh, well, I, I, you know, I don't, I don't, this is one of those things where you don't want to shine too bright a light on it because uh, I want it to stay mysterious and upsetting. Okay, sure. But it grew out of, I, I think, um, there's a mention of it's this boiled out, this particular strain of vampirism, vampirism boiled out of, um, the American Deep South and sort of, you know, the, the origin vampire. Uh, it's a, you know, a raped child of a raped child of a raped child. Um, you know, a, a powerful African-American presence. And not, the vampires are, are multiracial. It's not one race or the other. But the point is that somewhere at the intersection of black desperation and a totally understandable fury and white hate. Mm -hmm. Something so awful boiled up that it sort of helped make this happen. And so the culture is very much built around music, but also around um, a sort of randomization of events 
where they, they excite themselves by almost a numbers game to decide how they're going, who they're going to kill, how they're going to kill somebody, and so that they never have to feel guilty or feel anything about what they do. So they're constantly fighting boredom, and they can't stand each other, <laughs> and they have no interest in people at all, uh, except as things to play with. Um, some of them do get a kick out of having power over people, which many of them seem to be able to do, although not all of them can control it. So, uh, you know, I just I had a lot of fun with Good Girls. Part of the surprise of this trilogy has been getting more interested in the monsters than I these monsters than I ever thought I would be. And um, mm-hmm. vampires turn out. To, there's a reason it turns out that things like vampires or ghosts keep coming back, that they are incredibly flexible yes. creations, myths, and they right. really lend themselves to all kinds of ages and all kinds of stories. Bruce Wright, who uh, wrote about um, movies uh, mm-hmm. about 15 years ago, mm-hmm. he called Dracula literature's most enduring Rorschach plot. Great. Uh, that's actually a really – I know it's fantastic. Isn't yeah. It? <laughs> But, but that's actually a really great way of looking at uh, vampires in general, is that there's, a, there's an aspect of, of which we can just constantly keep reinventing this, you know, this fiction element over and over and over again, um, even more than, than we can reinvent almost anything else. You know? I, I, lawyer shows are lawyer shows. The good wife in the end is still just Perry Mason. Yep, with, yep, yep, um, yep. That, I really vampires. think that's true. And it turns out that... Um, uh, you know, I think vampires, it, it's so rich that it can be anything, that, that you don't have to limit it to any one thing. At the same time, part of the fun of playing with the genre at all is yeah. honoring some of the traditions and making them I, – I almost never say the word – I think the word vampire shows up once total in the first two books. Right. But anybody familiar with it would recognize, even though these creatures don't totally obey – the rules that have been set out. You know what you're dealing with, and in some ways, that's a crucial part of it, too. You know, that honoring the tradition yeah. while discovering new things within it is what's turned out to be so interesting and so fun about, about playing with this. That's fabulous. Yeah. Okay, I have a question in a different, in a different area. Sure. Because, um, that's about all the vampires, and I could actually keep asking you questions about that because I'm fascinated by... Just well, and you've written about that way. too. I have. No, I mean, yeah. Well, I, I was my first vampire series, my only vampire series to date, in novels, uh, came after I actually never intended to ever touch on vampires at all. <laughs> it just was, you know, and, and people for years. There's a recurring theme them. here, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I was like, uh, I just don't have anything to say about that, you know. Yeah. And for me, I hit on. Wait a minute. The terrorists are vampires, and then it was like, oh, ah, we're very good, yeah. Doing terrorist vampire novels, yeah. But my question is, um, one of your main characters in this book works in a, uh, a hotline, a suicide hotline, mm-hmm. and um, and it's really well done. It it really has this eye, this this verisimilitude. It certainly feels feels realistic, whether whether it has any bearing on reality or not. So my question is, why? Uh, how'd you pick that setting, and did you? Did you do any research, you know, to to sort of create this world and the little rules she has, like mm-hmm. she has rules that she's listening to that are posted on posters around the walls and stuff? Well, first, um, remember that? that I spent a lot of the last 20 years around teens. Uh, ah. So I, I certainly I have had students who do this. Um, I have had students who owe their lives to some of these. I have had people from organizations come in and uh, then the students make fun of the ridiculous rules that are at, at uh, you know, that are imposed on some of these hotlines. And yeah. so, but that sort of heightened sense of drama and then outlets for, for release, that's very much a part of contemporary teen life, I think. And so that came naturally, but honestly, the reason that I, I think I said it there had less to do with the, the hotline or, or that environment per se is the fact that, I wanted one of the because of what I think these books are about, and really I don't get to say, but what I think they're about, 
um, if, if they really are about people trying to sort of make connection or make some sort of meaning out of seemingly nonsensical existence, whether human or vampire, mm. what's a good girl and who gets to say? And so I very much, I think it's gotten easy and uh, we almost expect and, and praise, uh, we praise novels where the characters are, are fundamentally dislikable or rough-edged and that leads them into you know danger or whatever. And I wanted to write a novel where no, though the, you don't get that easy out. Yeah, these are these are good girls. Uh, right. So were the Starting vampires at one point, and maybe can be still or not. And so I really wanted to deal with characters who are doing what we think of people who are fundamentally decent people are doing they're helping other people they are you know they're not perfect people but um they're trying to do something useful with their time which is the exact opposite of what the vampires do Mm. so um i think that was why that happened i also think that you know that character the the in some ways the lead character in good girls or one of them is also an orphan and I think that motherlessness or that you know that thing that can set a lot of people adrift that's also a theme for mothers and vampires i mean for characters humans and vampires alike in the books and so one of the ways I think she has found to form connections, this orphan just recently out of a, a sort of foster home a group foster home and functioning for the first time by herself in the world in this sort of, you know, Gilmore Girls meets Dracula setting that I've set up. Uh, But one of her things, I I think one of her ways of forming connections is with strangers in need, that that's more comfortable for her in some ways. She understands that more at this point than, say, familial collections or long-term friendships because she hasn't had much of that. Right, right. That's where you're comfortable, you know. Right. Suppose, and which means, of course, that sometimes to grow, we have to move into relationships that are not as comfortable to us. Exactly. Um, even if they're easier, um, or even if they're what everybody else would think to be easier. Yeah. And which does it, right? I think that's right. Okay. Last question that, sure. I, that I wanted to ask you about um, process. Are you working on a book right now? Actually. I am. I'm working on uh, the. Well, I have. I've just finished and have coming out on April sixth. Um, a novella that took me forever to get right uh, about Russia called Freedom is Space for the Spirit. They, about, it's a supernatural, uh, supernatural snowy St. Petersburg and bears story. And then I am about halfway through the last Motherless Children book, which will definitely be my last vampire story, <laughs> he says now. <laughs> exactly. That's true as of today. As of right um, now, I am positive that that is true. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, okay. So, when if you're writing right now, I mean, um, do you like, like for, if, just uh, to give it? A, like, I, I did an interview with Jennifer Ziegler, and mm-hmm. she writes books in much the way I do, which is to say, we outline, we build spreadsheets, we follow the spreadsheet, and that way you know that, like, when you're reaching such and such chapter, that's the beginning of Act Three, and all these things right. need to be done. Do you do that, or are you on the other spectrum where you're just like, I don't know what's happening, and you just go, and or something in between? So this might be a frustrating answer for you. I'm on the whatever gets this book that I'm working on written track. <laughs> I, I have really done it a lot of different ways, to be honest. Um, you know, one thing I'm a full-time dad. I've been a full-time teacher uh, for twenty some years, um, and. This is book number, you know, Good Girls is book number seven. And I, one of the things I have learned, one of the things that's made it possible for me, and I don't, I, I don't believe in dictating process to anybody, although I think we all learn a lot or just get comfort from hearing each other's processes. But for me, yeah. it really is I get up every day and I find a way to fit some writing in, no matter what. And I don't. I'm not fussy about this is the way I work and this is the way it has to be, or this is the music I have to have on. I have preferences. I would love to be able, my preferred way 
would probably be to go sort of a smaller, a, a more incremental version of what you're talking about, where it's sort of to spend one day sketching out and having a pretty good idea of the arc of the next, say, chapter I'm working on, and then to write that. I've had books where, like, Motherless Child literally felt like somebody went by and, hand, and dropped it off, uh, where I didn't even – I wasn't even conscious of thinking about it as I was writing it. It was whole when it came to me. Good Girls is much more typical of my process, which is a lot of wrestling, gnashing of teeth, waking up in the middle of the night and telling my wife, this book sucks, having her punch me, you know <laughs> – uh, and then just sort of making myself get up the next day, even though I'm sure this book sucks, and fighting my way through it. The, I've had books. I had a uh, an alternate history novel that I wrote a few years ago called The Book of Bunk, which took me 13 years to get to get right. And what finally got it right was doing what you're talking about, was stepping all the way back and realizing, oh, that's what I've done wrong every single time. Uh, but it took stepping Although all the way not, back and sort of cool laying for, I mean, everything out in a very systematic way that allowed me to see it. But that, that, that's the only time I've ever done it quite on that scale. And certainly the trilogy, I would love to have had the luxury of yeah. planning it, but since I didn't even know it was going to be a story. No, really, <laughs> right. right. So. I mean, Stephen King swears against doing any kind of outlining, for what it's worth. He's, I, he's, I know. No. I really, I try, I guess I I try not to swear against. Right. <laughs> that's, that's, that's probably wise. I liked what you said about how we, we find great comfort. And I think, I think there's comfort. I think there's even, I think, I think there's great learning. I, me too. I enjoy hearing other people's process, even if my process will completely deviate from that. There are people who um, have told me, I remember having a, a conversation with Amy Bender who did a Rolling Darkness review with us once. And she told me this thing that I immediately, my first thought was, oh, God, I'm going to start doing that. Immediately realized that would never work for me. And then I just got horrifically jealous. Uh, what she said is, yeah, I have about, I don't know, 8 to 15 different projects running at any one time. And I just get up and say, okay, what do I feel like writing today? Right. Which is... <laughs> So That's not. Wonderful. I mean, you know how I work. <laughs> I mean, the, the, I, I spoke to. Uh, I haven't done an interview with him yet, but Kevin J. Anderson, mm -hmm. and he does his. Well, no, I take it back. I interviewed him about 15 years ago for a magazine. But right. uh, he writes completely through dictation. You know, he really? like walks around, talks it all yes, out, the whole damn thing. Wow. He, he dictates the book into what at the time was a micro cassette recorder. Right. And is, is now whatever it is. But, you know, can you believe that? I mean, right. then it cleans it up, right? It is so hard for me to keep track of the whole... I feel like novels... I've come to have such a respect for, you know, the editing process. If one has... You know, my best editors, uh, my most ruthless editor is, is my wife, actually. Uh, yeah. uh, but having those three or four people... Because I think novels, they're so big, really. Yeah. It's hard to get back enough to see the whole thing. I don't, I don't think anybody can do it, although it sounds like he can, let alone I, speaking it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, just think about it. Being able to, to compose sentences that sound like prose, yeah. as, you know, like, like uh, you know, Mulder swam towards the island. You know, yeah. He was swimming, he thought about it. It's difficult to figure out, like, how the kind of stuff that you can do with your fingers because you've been doing it for 20 years. Yeah. It's difficult. But, you know, maybe you just got that down. I, I was amazed by that. So, yes. Yeah, me too. Uh, but again, I, say, I never say never because, yeah. it, I, <laughs> you know, the, the next time I really become convinced that something sucks, maybe I'll try that. Because yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm endlessly fascinated. It sounds like you are too. Yes. by the incredibly creative ways that the other creative people I know come up with to honor or to be creative, to get the, to make something useful out of that. Yes. Um, because just the fact that you have an idea is so barely the beginning of actually getting, getting work done. 
Oh, my God, yes. Getting work done, that's a magical phrase. Yeah. To me, it has capital letters. You know, I would say, listen, I'm having a hard time getting work done. It, it's, a, it's a phrase that means something I, to a writer. I tell <laughs> my students all the time, I really believe this. I mean, the business has always been awful, and, yeah, in a lot of ways, it's probably worse than ever now. Yes, I don't it's so. hard. I, I, no, go ahead, I'm sorry. So I was just going to say – Yes, it's hard I to make a living. I apologize. I shouldn't have stepped in here. <laughs> no, that's okay. I, and I, I, I have a feeling like I was going to say, and you might be right. But yes, it's hard to make a living. Yes, it's hard. Uh, yeah, you know, yes, the, the sort of there's always a reason not to feel respected or you know to feel slighted or all that kind of stuff. That's all hard. Yeah. But the hardest part of being a writer, to me, by far is getting yeah. the work done because life will always give you a totally valid reason not to. That's right. A, a reason that feels good. Yeah, a, a reason of, that really might be a healthy reason not to. A sort of, well, it's just kind of this inviting bliss of not doing anything. Yep. You know? and, and, yeah, I mean, but I, I feel a constant guilt. If, I, if a week goes by and I haven't done any writing, Unless I give myself permission at the beginning of the week and say we're not writing this week. This week yeah. we're going a lot of doing a lot of hiking. Right. But the default is there will be work. Okay. So if there's no work, I'm like, oh, what? What right do you have? It feels <laughs> I I sort of feel like the only way to really reliably and again, this is for me. Um, yeah. Not I'm not dictating to other people, but this is what work has worked for a long time for me is making it really a lot like brushing my teeth, meaning a thing I do that if I don't do it pretty much every day, unless it's one of those rare days or weeks where you say, good, I'm between projects, I'm taking a week off. Um, if you don't do it, it doesn't feel good to go to sleep. The day feels right. unfinished. And you said you tend to, to write uh, at uh, in the morning, like like when you get up? Or... No, I write whenever I have the window. I mean, there was a time... When I was you know, before I had kids, um, where I was writing really early in the morning, um, I would get up and write before I went to work. And then there were some years when I was teaching college, and when uh, I had an arrangement with with uh, Campbell Hall with the high school where I spent most of my high school life, uh, where I was going in every other day, and I was I was working you know at home on those days. But honestly, most of my adult life, most of my working life has been I write before school if I can. Um, mm -hmm. I write in the evening if I have to, although I hate doing that because I don't sleep. Uh, every now and it takes a while to shut down. Every now and then there will be, uh, you know, lunch will be wide open at school during the day and I can lock myself up for an hour and work then. Um, but I've, one thing I have done to, to mitigate the guild a little bit, or really just to make it doable, is I have to write every day, but I don't have a word limit or a uh, a time limit. You know, if there's a day where there's only 20 minutes that are going to be possible, I have trained myself to drop into that writing place really fast and have a good productive 20 minutes. Um, and then, then there are days oh, where fantastic. I get two hours. Um, it there's just a, there's, there's, that makes sense, and there's a tradition of that because, like, I, I need to learn that because I have a tendency to go, you know what, I need, like, two hours of time I used to library. yeah right you know but it gets more and more and more difficult but your way is sort of like Jane Austen um, in theory I mean, the, the story that, that's told is that Austen was able to realize she had 15 minutes of time just set aside whatever needlework she was doing right and scribble out some oh, know, fantastic. Of, a, of a chapter and yeah. then put it away and that was just and that's how she just turned out books and um I that's really, I have not heard that. That's really interesting. I like that. Um, yeah, and uh, you know, again, not for everybody, but I do think I definitely have things I use. I don't know if you do this, but there are a couple of composers whose very sort of still, melancholy, very to me, very evocative music. So one of the things I will do is, whoop, I have 15 minutes and hit that, you know, Immediately, put that like on. Like a long piece. And it's right, like and it's like this I'm signal to my brain. Oh, we're writing now. Huh? 
Well, like what? Like Berber's, um, oh, what's that Berber? Oh, the Adagio for strings. That, that'd yeah. do it. That's not what I use, although that would do it. Um, there's actually, lately especially, there's a British, uh, really interesting guy, uh, a British composer named Richard Skelton, um, who um, he, well, also, he, he also uh, compiles these like myths of landscape and stuff uh, in in the area of England where he lives, he's a really interesting guy. Um, but he he started uh, at least he started releasing a lot of this music after his first wife died, like really young. Like I think they were in their twenties. Um, and the music it's not it's not as uh, heartbreaking as the Daggio for strings, but it's got this sort of haze of melancholy and it, it creates space and uh, somehow it's exactly the place I seem to write from. So it really helps oh, get me there. Great. So. That's that's fantastic. I mean, I, you know, I know that mm, like I've been listening to a lot of like soundtrack stuff recently. It just depends on the, on, on the book. You know? Right. If, if, if it's something that's very James Bondy, I'll literally listen to Shh. Yeah, can you do that? I know that um, you know King claims that he writes to Metallica, which is unimaginable to me, no matter what I'm writing. But I can imagine it. No, I can I can totally see that. I did a book mostly to Rob Zombie at one point. No kidding. Um, I can I can I can see it. And the last one was completely to surf rock. You know you know like yeah. the sand bowls and stuff like that. It's not so that I can't that. don't have places for all that music in my life. I am a music freak. Yeah. But when it, but writing at least so far, even when I'm writing something that isn't really that mood, Richard maybe it's just that my brain has so been trained that that's the trigger. Well, I mean that's listen. Any way you can to me, the writing mind is like this this beast that occasionally breaks free and you have to haul it back in. <laughs> any way that you can yeah. sneak up on it and grab it and haul it back, right, is fair game. You know, right, it, it's. Um, it's a it's it's endlessly mysterious to me how me you can force yourself to get work done. Um, well, anyway, I I have definitely um, I know that I've I've kept you for a long time. I deeply but appreciate I've enjoyed it. I'm oh I'm glad I'm so glad. Um, the book is called Good Girls. It's out from Tor. Fantastic publisher. Fantastic beginning. I'm 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 really enjoying this. And uh, Glenn Hirschberg, I hope that the book does very well for you. And um, I hope we get a chance to talk again soon. So yes, have a thanks. fantastic evening. Thank you, you too. It's been a pleasure. Yes, sir. Bye. Thank you. Bye.